Hey everybody, this is Chris. I just wanted to send out an abridged version of the talk that I gave in conference the other day about my CEP on droperidol use in the ED. Essentially just to loop you all in and give a little background on the thought process that went into the guidelines that I made. So to start, I'll just go over the basics of what is droperidol for those of you who don't know. It's a first generation antipsychotic, just like haloperidol. The doses that we're talking about using in the ED are one to 10 milligrams IV or IM roughly and it'll be used for the treatment of nausea, vomiting, agitation, and headache that we're talking about here. You can basically think it of a faster um, haloperidol as it generally onsets three to 10 minutes IV or IM, and the duration of action is a little shorter as well. Um, the adverse events are the same thing that we'll think about with haloperidol, QT prolongation, which we'll talk about more, and extrapyramidal side effects. So the main reason that I think that these guidelines are useful to have is because of the black box warning placed on the medication. So droperidol went from being used very frequently in the 70s and then up into the 90s. There was some whispers about it causing adverse cardiac effects. And in 2001, the FDA placed this black box warning on the medication. It essentially recommends for an EKG before administration of the medication and after um, for monitoring for two to three hours. The only additional comment that the FDA has made since putting this out is that in 2003, they clarified that this did not apply to doses under 2.5 milligrams, as these are technically off-label uses of the medication. So after the FDA placed this black box warning on the medication, as you can imagine, a lot of people who were using this medication effectively in their practice for many years before this set out to vindicate it. Um, one of these groups was Jackson et al., who through a Freedom of Information request, obtained the MedWatch data that the FDA used to create the black box warning. The gist of it is that 97 total reports, 65 unique cases, because there was a whole lot of duplicates. Um, some of these patients experiencing the torsades and who died from torsades got doses of up to 600 milligrams IV, which if you remember the doses in the ED that we're talking about are like one to 10 milligrams IV, so significantly higher. There was a whole lot of confounding variables um, with patients comorbid medical problems and additional QT prolonging medications without any temporal relation to the uh, dose of droperidol given. The other thing to point out is that most of these reports came on the same day, which has led to some conspiracy theories that I'm not gonna go into, but they are interesting to look into if you would like. So in addition to the research from the previous slide, there's also been a lot of research basically trying to um, reaffirm the effectiveness and the safety of using droperidol in the ED. As a result of all those preceding studies, in 2013, AAEM put out a clinical practice statement basically saying that it's safe and effective to use in the emergency department and disagreeing that the black box warning um, should apply to doses under 2.5 milligrams, which the FDA had already come out and said that it shouldn't. Um, seven, eight years later, ASAP finally came around too and said essentially the same thing. The only other things that I'll note is that in looking at all these studies, None of them are reporting any adverse effects of torsades or um, VTAC. There are studies that were looking specifically at QT prolongation and they found that, surprise, it does prolong the QT, but there have been no instances of those sequelae that we're worried about, so the torsades or VTAC. Um, I think that's probably an area that still needs a little bit more research. Um, it seems like the peak effects of this are generally within the first 30 minutes, but again, that's not based on a whole lot of research, just a couple studies. I'll just briefly touch on the clinical uses of the medication in the ED as well. So what we're talking about when we're talking about using droperidol in the ED is for the treatment of nausea and vomiting, agitation, and headache. The gist of all of these studies that I've cited here is that it essentially seems to be equally effective to a lot of the medications that we'll reach for for the treatment of these, you know, sometimes tough to manage conditions. I'll just highlight a couple things, which is that for nausea and vomiting, it seems to be particularly useful in cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome as it allows us, at least in this study, to discharge patients faster and require less additional doses of medication. Um, for agitation, it appears to work faster than haloperidol, which is what we talked about before, but that the combination with midazolam and droperidol seems to be a really good one in that it works faster than either of the medications used individually. And Here's just kind of a reminder of those agitation medications um, by speed of action. And then a little less data on headaches, but it seems to be as effective as the medications we typically reach for there as well.
Here we have the part of the guideline that deals with dosing recommendations. You can essentially split this up into nausea, vomiting, headache dosing, which is 2.5 milligrams or under IM or IV, and then agitation dosing, which is 5 to 10 uh, milligrams IM or IV. And then here is that second part of the guidelines that importantly deals with the EKG and cardiac uh, monitoring aspect. You can essentially split this up in a similar way in that those small doses that the FDA warning technically does not apply to don't have any recommendation for an EKG beforehand or cardiac monitoring afterwards. Those agitation doses of five milligrams or higher. The important thing to note here is that in both of those professional guidelines, what they say is that not delaying care to achieve these monitoring requirements is also an important factor. So as you can imagine, if you have an agitated patient um, who is a danger to themselves or staff, it's not really practical or beneficial to try to get an EKG beforehand or put them on the monitor before you give them the medication. So I think that fits pretty nicely with our current workflow, which is, you know, when you have a patient that is agitated, you give them the medication, you put the physical restraints on, and then you put them on the monitor. And I think that that's a pretty, you know, practical way to use this medication for that as well. The kind of in-between area is a little bit less studied just because they're not initial starting doses for really any of those indications we talked about before. So when you're in that sort of limbo zone of 2.5 to 5 milligrams IM or IV for high-risk patients, which is, you know, outlined in those guidelines, um, talking about age over 65, female sex, hypokalemia, or other QT prolonging meds, to um, get an EKG beforehand if you have time and to consider monitoring afterwards. And here are just the key takeaways, I think, from our discussion so far. Um, not to rehash all of them, but the one that I don't think that I talked about is that it's now in the Pixis at all three campuses, thanks to Liz. And then references for everything we talked about.